audiobook, Simply This Moment. 12 Reflections That Are Conducive to Liberation, 2. 6th of September 2000. Riga. People talk about Riga as being dispassion but that's only one possible meaning for the word. The meaning that I prefer is fading away. It's almost like a precursor to Naroda, something that happens before cessation is experienced, Riga, the fading away of things. After you've experienced Hygiena, you can contemplate that word. Virga, fading away. The whole idea of fading away is relinquishment. It's not relinquishing things, rather it's you doing the disappearing act, you becoming the invisible man, so invisible that you just completely disappear and nothing is left. In this way there is the fading away of all phenomena, the fading away of the body, the fading away of the world outside, the beautiful fading away of feelings, the happiness and sadness that occupies the mind even more than thoughts. The great problem of existence is pleasure and pain. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have an end to that problem, to have all the business finished once and for all, to have all your work completed? How can you ever rest when you have pleasure and pain? How can there ever be comfort, contentment, stillness, and peace when Vedana is still active? It's impossible. People in the world try to generate Vedana, try to generate intense Vedana, thinking that that is the way to experience happiness and fulfillment in this world. Sometimes people watch films that frighten the hell out of them or they go to sad movies where they cry their eyes out. It's amazing, they just want more intense pain, more intense pleasure. That's the way of the world. The way of the Buddha, the way of the Sama A, recluse, is to come all of this, to watch it fade away dash. To watch the Vedanas of the world, the intensity of feelings of the world, get less and less and disappear. The longer you stay in monastic life the more you see that now. You don't shake and quiver with Vedanas as you did as a lay person. You see that. Whatever the world gives you with its vagaries, with its uncertainties, the mind doesn't shake. What before would be a very unpleasant Vedana, now doesn't shake the mind. What before would be incredibly pleasant and exciting, now is not. The Vedana is beginning to fade away and with that fading away of Vedana comes a softening. With the gentling of Vedana you get this beautiful peace and that peace by itself is a type of happiness which people in the world can rarely even understand, let alone experience. People in the world think that if all Vedana starts to disappear then how can there be happiness? How can there be bliss when you're not doing anything, just sitting quiet? Still, the most bliss you can ever experience in this realm is in deep meditation. Sitting here some of you have experienced it yourselves? If you really want happiness, the happiness of the mind exceeds all other pleasures, it not only exceeds them in its amplitude of happiness, in its degree of pleasure, of raw bliss, but also in its depth and profundity. This is not a shallow superficial thing, this is something that is a rich happiness which you sense when you experience it. It's happiness that is going to the core, it's not just covering you in some fine raiment that you understand is not real. There is something real and meaningful here. As you go into that deep happiness, into that deep stillness, you understand that through the coming of Vedana, you get all the contentment, all the satisfaction that you ever wanted. From the fading away comes the treasure of getting closer to emptiness getting closer to Naroda and Nibbana, where everything is gone. When one understands Vriga in this particular way it will lead you not just into insight but also into calm. It will lead to yourself. Fading away, the knower and the doer disappearing, fading, fading, fading. And as you play around with that concept you begin to understand not just the end of the path, not just Nibbana, 
but you understand why you are practicing this eightfold path. You understand that Vriga is all about fading away. When you start practicing the precepts and the rules of the monastery so much of the harshness of your character fades away. That's the reason people who have been monks or nuns for many years become very soft, gentle, friendly beings, people whom lay people just love to be around. It's as if all of their harshness and unpleasantness has faded away. That's the result of the precepts, of keeping rules, of keeping sila. Certain aspects of your personality fade, and it's wonderful to see the fading away of what is really quite unwholesome, your ill will, bad speech, and bad actions. When they fade away you understand what this path is all about. Once those things fade away you can see how through sense restraint other things are also fading away, those excitements and titillations that once would occupy your whole day are fading away. You're allowing all your old memories to fade away, all of the past, with all of its difficulties and also its pleasures. You allow it all to fade away to become a person with no history, no past, someone who can let go of time. All your worries and plans about the future, they too are fading away. In the lay world people spend almost all of their life in the past or the future. When that fades away you're left with the beautiful present moment, just the now. Once things start to fade away you understand that you have to allow thinking to fade. Not to cut it out and stop it, not to try and destroy it, that's just doing it through power. Self and ego, through a sense of me dash but to allow it to fade. The word Vriga is beautiful in its meaning. By taking away your interest, by taking away your sense of value in these things, they fade and disappear, if you're patient enough to give them time. They fade, and you find yourself meditating on the breath. Everything else has faded away, your past and your future. All those stupid thoughts, all of your business, all of your lust. The body is about to fade away because all you have is just the one breath you are watching. So much has faded and disappeared, and now you are watching the breath fade away. The breath gets softer and softer, more and more beautiful, and more and more profound, fading, fading, fading. With the fading away of the breath, the doer, this very active, problematical control freak, is fading. Fading, fading. It's hardly doing anything at all. When you get to the beautiful breath, nothing much is happening, even consciousness is fading. Instead of consciousness being spread all over the place, much of consciousness has faded away. Sight. Consciousness, sound consciousness, all faded, disappeared. Smell and taste. Consciousness, faded away into nothing, ended, ceased. You've just got this very refined sense of touch on the breath, just in this moment, a very subtle breath, nothing else is felt in the body. It's all fading away. That gives you so much happiness and pleasure because dukkha is fading, disappearing. At last you are beginning to understand the path. The path that you've been hoping for, the path that you ordained for. The path you have been searching for, studying for. What you've been born for is happening. You are experiencing the fading away of suffering, not just thinking about it, not writing a book about it, but you're right there when it's happening and it's beautiful, wonderful, and inspiring. You see the Dhamma start to manifest as suffering fades away. The process takes over because this is what the mind has been born for, this is why the whole process is happening at last. Once you start to allow everything to fade away, the breath fades and you're just left with a nimitta. The nimitta was there all along just covered by the breath. When the breath fades it reveals the nimitta. The simile the Buddha gave is that it is like the clouds obscuring the full moon. When the clouds part the moon manifests. The moon was 
there all the time it was just that it was covered. The moon here is the reflection of your mind. It's always there, you're just attending too much to all these other things. When the breath fades away, there is the mind experienced as the nimitta. It allows the last bit of the doer to fade away, things disappear, and you enter a jhana. Whenever you experience the jhanas and reflect on them you see they are all stages of letting go. That's the reason a lot of people can't gain jhanas, they are holding on to too much attachment, too much clinging, they just won't let these things fade. They try to either make them fade or try and keep them out of fear, out of stubbornness. But the way into jhana is to allow them to fade away. The fading away of the doer is completed in the second jhana. The fading away of consciousness now starts to happen as more and more things are let go of. The mind gets more and more refined in these different stages of jhana, until everything fades away completely in the experience of Naroda. Afterwards, you see that the whole process is a process of giving up, letting go, abandoning, and relinquishing. Naroda All these beautiful Pali words in Buddhism are seen as an experience. You've walked on the path and they have been the signposts, the sights along the way. This is what it looks like on the journey. This is the territory and, as these things all fade away, you understand what Vriga truly means. Vriga is the path. By letting go, by relinquishing, all these things happen by themselves. But you especially understand Naroda, the ending, the cessation of things. That is a very hard word to understand. Because we only know things that are there. It's hard to perceive something that is not there. Without understanding Naroda we're especially unlikely to allow the possibility of that which we are truly attached to and cling to, to cease. It's always partial. Those things that we don't like, that we don't want, we can allow them to cease. But there are some parts of us that we do not want to give up, that we do not want to cease that we do not want to disappear. This is where attachment and clinging stops us from experiencing the fruits of cessation and understanding its meaning as an experience. One of the insights that are most likely after a jhana experience is the insight into the meaning of Naroda, because this is one's first experience of anything absolutely vanishing and completely ceasing. The five senses that were there once are now, for a long period of time, no longer there. In the simile that I have given before about the television set, it's not just the program changing, it's the whole television set, which has been there as long as you can remember, disappearing. All you see are the programs on the screen, changing. Now for the first time in your memory the whole television set has completely vanished. It's completely gone, it is Naroda. The very possibility of that was completely beyond you, you couldn't even conceive of that happening. But after a jhana you know it has happened, you've been there and you've experienced the profoundness of cessation. That which was once impossible, you have experienced. You've seen the five senses gone, you've seen the doer gone. In the second jhana you're completely, absolutely frozen. No satina intention, is possible, no control at all. The mind is absolutely still, with a stillness. You cannot conceive of. You cannot even imagine it. Those jhana states are weird, and that is why people who haven't had any experience of them they always fall flat on their faces when they try to explain them. They haven't got a clue what those things are. Once those states are experienced for what they truly are, then you can really see that something very big has gone, especially the going of the doer. The doer has been most of what you thought you were. That's what we call the house builder in Buddhism. It's one of the biggest causes, if not the cause of rebirth. It's what keeps Sisera going, always building new houses. 
New tasks, new things to do, it makes the wheel go around. You see that doing has completely, absolutely gone. You're just sitting there absolutely still, frozen, no doer. Because there is no doer that's the reason there's no movement, I really mean no movement, just one mind object for a long period of time without even a wobble or a shake, but life is still there. Once that is experienced and you emerge. Afterwards, you've seen something that you thought impossible, an absolute disappearing and going to cessation. That which you thought was an absolute you realize is impermanent, and it can fade and actually end in peace. Once you can admit the possibility of such cessation then you can understand it. Uh, there is nothing substantial here because you know it can cease absolutely, completely. There is nothing remaining whatsoever, not even a cosmic or unmanifest consciousness. Cessation is cessation is cessation. If there was something left it wouldn't be called cessation. Once you can see that from your own experience it gives you the fuel for the experience of stream winning, it gives you the seed. Cessation has happened and you can start to understand that what you took to be self, what you took to be me, what you took to be mine, is subject to cessation, it is neurodadama. You now know what neuroda means. You know it applies to all the five senses, you know it applies to will, and it's only a small step to know that it applies to consciousness as well. That which you thought was you, the one who knows, ceases. It goes completely without any remainder. When you see that degree of Nero do you have the opportunity to experience the enlightenment experiences. You see the path of inclining towards cessation, not towards building up more things, more possessions, more thoughts, or more attainments. Allow everything to cease by giving up, relinquishing, and letting go. You see how little one can live with. You see how few thoughts one can keep in one's mind. You see how little one can sleep, how little one can eat, how little one need talk, how little one need think. How much can you give up? After a while one inclines to giving up the whole lot. Neroda happens, and you see that Neroda is the highest happiness. It's well worth doing and then maybe you can have some idea of the fourth contemplation, pa in saga. Pa in saga. Pa in the saga is giving up, rejecting, or forsaking. I encourage the study of Pali in this monastery because it does uncover some things that do not always come out in the translations. The word pa in the saga you might recognize from the Vinaya, from the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th saskadizes. Pa in the saga is a noun. The verb for it is pa in the sajjati, and it's used for a person who abandons their wrong course of action. In the 10th saskadizasa it is ceasing to cause a schism, in the 11th giving up support for a schism, in the 12th giving up the refusal to be admonished, and in the 13th giving up the criticism of the act of banishment. The same word. Pa in the saga is giving up views, ways of using the mind, thoughts, perceptions. It's abandoning on that level, it's not so much giving up material things such as your robe, your sugar, or worldly possessions, or for a layperson your money, car, etc. This is giving up on the very deepest levels of cognition. We can give away many things in this life but what we find it hard to give up are those things that we call our mental possessions, our pride, our sense of self, our knowledge, and our sense of being. Someone who no one else can tread on, all those senses of an eye. That's what we find hard to abandon. But it has to be abandoned if one wishes to become enlightened. The sense of self with all its ramifications, the stupidity, pride, and pain creates more fire that burns you inside. It's called dukkha. Please don't buy into all of that, allow it to fade, to cease. See if you can give up all 
of the aspects of self-view, so that when you do the reflection on Pa in Isaga it's not the worldly material things that you are giving up, it's the things of the mind. You're abandoning, giving away, letting go of your past and future. In the Saska Dizasa rules, a monk is asked in front of the Saska three times to give something up, give that up. Give that up, if you don't you incur the offense of Saska Dizasa. The Buddha is asking you to give up your sense of past and future, and if you don't give it up you get suffering. Give up your thinking, your thoughts, otherwise you get headaches. Give up all of your sense of control, of me and mine, my ideas, my rights, my will, my mind, and my plans, see if you can apply Pa in the Saga to those. Have the courage. And see what happens. What happens is that you become peaceful. These things are the stuff of fetters, the stuff of defilements, the stuff of craving. When you see that, through contemplating Pa in the Saga you are abandoning not just the outside world. You are abandoning the inside world. If you develop that Pa in the Saga perception, throughout the practice of meditation you'll find that meditation gets so easy. In the Indriya Sayyata, SN. Zilvi. 9, there is a word that is very close to Pa in the Saga. Vasaga, relinquishing, giving up. The Sutta says that if you develop that mind of abandoning you very easily attain Samadhi, you attain the Janas easily. Pa in the Saga, the perception of abandoning the inner thoughts, the inner ideas and the inner illusions, is a beautiful fast track to the deep meditations. See how much you can give up, especially your ideas, your thoughts, and even some of the ways that you perceive. If you can do that you are applying the contemplation of Pa in the Saga to developing deep meditation. After deep meditation contemplate Pa in the Saga even further. You're abandoning all of those mental defilements, cravings, wrong views, wrong perceptions, and the wrong thoughts called the vipalasas, the perversions of cognition, what we call a vijja, delusion. Abandoning your delusions you're giving them up, you're allowing them to cease until there's nothing there. If you can do that, you can get on the path to deep insights, and you find that you can give up everything. Because there is nothing there anyway. There's nothing to keep, nothing worth holding on to. As the Lord Buddha said, Sabdhamanala Abhinav Sayaya, Amen. 37, That's Beautiful. Again for those who know Pali there is a related word Nivasa, it means lodging, or an abiding. I like to translate Sabdhamanala Abhinav Sayaya. As, all, everything completely, is not worth hanging out in, not worth making an abiding in, not worth making a home for the consciousness or for the doer. It's usually translated as nothing is worth attaching to, which misses most of the meaning. When you understand the idea of Nivasa as a place where you abide, live, and create a home, and then you understand the full meaning and you understand why you can actually abandon everything. You understand why Pa in the Saga, the abandoning of wrong thoughts, wrong views, wrong thinking, wrong use of the mind, is a path to both Janas and Nibbana. Conclusion so these are ways of using those four reflections at the end of the Anapanasati Sutta. Anukkha, Vriga, Naroda, and Pa in the Saga. When the Buddha taught those reflections, he meant them to be done extremely deeply, extremely beautifully, very powerfully, and very wonderfully. Unless you are an era and never think that you understand these words completely. That's why it's good to allow them to roll around in the mind, allow the mind to play around with them, allow the mind to recognize them. There may have been experiences in the past, in the long distant past, when you knew those words. They can resonate now and take you to the same territory, the territory of the Janas, the territory of Magathala, the path and fruit, the territory of peace.
So play with those words especially after a deep meditation. They can lead you into jhanas. They can lead you into complete release jhanas. They can lead you into complete release jhanas. They can lead you into complete release jhanas. They can